8, uh, 16. I, I was in a quandary this uh, past week as to how much to try to cover because we're actually going to wind up covering a little less than I would like to. But if we went any further, it was going to get into this rather lengthy story, the healing of the uh, Gadarene demoniac, you know, and I knew I couldn't make it through all of that. And so you have to make these judgments along the way. And so this morning we're going to be a little bit more leisurely because we have a little less to cover, but we'll take these three short snor- stories. Uh, the light and the vessel, this kind of a parabolic uh, account here, Jesus uh, teaching, and then uh, this interesting encounter between Jesus and his mother and his brothers, and then finally the calming of the storm, one of my favorite stories in uh, Luke, so we'll take all of that this morning. Just uh, to remind you, I was going to write something up here, so maybe I'll do that. We uh, are looking at Jesus' uh, mission, and it seems to me, as we've said before, that each of these stories is highlighting some feature, some aspect of the mission of Christ. So I'm calling the first one uh, to, um, to liberate, and the second one to divide. And then the third one coming, the next three that we have today, to reveal. I don't like the one, I'm hoping you can help me with my word. It it doesn't quite do it, but I'm going to call it tentatively, just for the sake of getting something up here, to unite. Then I'll explain what I mean by that. And then finally, this one's a little easier, to protect or to guard. And there's more, but uh, we're covering essentially these three this morning. Not to liberate Ed, that's not really very good grammar. (laughs) To to liberate, uh, that was the story of the woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears, dries it with her hair. The, it seems to me that the point of the story is the contrast between this woman who's in a kind of reckless abandon of any, any sense of uh, you know, self-respect or anything. She just gushes her affection for Christ, unaware, unconcerned about what people may think, judgments they may pass. She's so grateful for what Christ has given her in his grace and in his forgiveness that she just wants to come and lavish on him the best of what she has, both her alabaster box of myrrh and the deeper gift of her own heart. And and in contrast to Simon the Pharisee, all tied up in knots, how is he being viewed, what's his status in society, and all of these kinds of things. And one of the great things that happens, as you know, as we're touched by God's grace, is it really frees us from that. We really can kind of step away from all of those concerns that have to do with artificial distinctions we tend to make among ourselves and between ourselves so we can really be released from that self-absorption, liberated from that to just be lovingly devoted to Christ. I think that's what that story is teaching us. Last uh, time we were together, two weeks ago, uh, this, the parable of the sower, teaches us that the gospel divides. Jesus divides. There's a divisiveness about him. He himself talks about separating sheep from goats, you know, wheat from tares. He says on one occasion, I came to bring not peace but a sword, which sometimes is overstated, but I think sometimes we understate it too. There is a a sense in which Jesus divides the crowd. Uh, There are those who come and those who run. Uh, Paul talks about that. The gospel for some is an aroma that attracts them and a stench for others that repels them. There's a division that's created by his message. And that really, the parable of the sower seems to say that. The the seed goes out, it lands on all of these various kinds of soil. Most of them, the seed is wasted. You know, no shortage of seed, no shortage of light, but the fact is, finally, most of the ground, it just produces nothing. There's only a minority, one ground, that really brings forth fruit. So uh, I think that's at least one way to describe it. The three that we have today to reveal has to do with the light set on a lamp. We'll look at that. To unite, this is the story of Jesus and his mother and his brothers who come and want to see him. 
And I don't mean here to unite. What I mean is he unites us in a new family, a more profound family than simply the biological connections we might have. I think that's what Luke wants to get over to us. So I don't like this word unite because it doesn't quite say it, but I can't come up with a good English word for this. So help me. If you come up with something, let me know. Uh, and then finally, to protect. That's the story of the di- disciples in the, in the boat as they're crossing and the storm comes in and so on. Uh, the beginning of this whole section, the mission of Christ, of course, is John the Baptist. He puts the thing in sharp relief. Are you the one who is to come or do we wait for another? Questioning the mission, or at least the strategy of his mission. It ends, at least I think uh, the dramatic end point to this, is when he sends out his disciples on a mission. And they come back excited because they say even the demons are subject to them. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And that's a clue. You see, that really tells us the consummate point of his mission is to take back from a usurper what is rightfully the possession of God, rightfully the possession of Christ. Uh, This whole human race has been, as it were, taken over by a usurper from the Garden of Eden. uh, Satan came and won the allegiance of the human race. In a sense, we made him the prince of the power of the air by voting for him instead of voting for God. You know, that whole deal. Uh, Jerusalem is is a kind of visible symbol of that because Jerusalem was being usurped. These illegitimate leaders who had a stranglehold on the very lifeblood of the holy city. We're turning it into a gravy train for personal profit rather than being trustees in this remarkable fiduciary obligation they had before God to make the temple a house of prayer for the nations. They turned it into a den of thieves. And so Jesus is going to attack and take back from those human usurpers the kingdom given to a nation worthy of it and at the same time even more profoundly take back from that sort of supernatural usurper, Satan himself, this domineering force, this power that he had over the human race. And so uh, that's kind of the big scheme here. And all of these little points are different highlights of it, different angles of it, sort of spin-off effects, if you will. So here we are, uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 16. We'll just take this a little bit at a time, so just the first three verses here. This is the Word of God. No one having lit a lamp covers it with a kitchen pot or puts it under a bed, but upon a lampstand in order that those who are going in may see the light. There is nothing secret that will not become manifest. There is nothing hidden that will not be known and broadcast. Be careful, therefore, how you hear. For the one who has will receive more, but the one who does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken from him. Each verse, a little bit of a lesson there. So let's uh, let's ask God's blessing on our reflection on this. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this privilege that it is once again to be together with your people. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity and light that it brings into our lives. And even as we reflect this morning on the light that comes to the gospel, we pray that we would be illumined ourselves through a reflection on this text. Give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 16. No one having lit a lamp or a candle, it could be either one, covers it with a skewe. That's a, that's a term that simply meant a kitchen vessel. And I just think of a big uh, pot or pan or something like that. You don't light a lamp and put a big pot over it. That probably drew a smile, you see, from the hearers, a little bit of Jesus' uh, dry humor there. Uh, nor do you light a lamp and put it under the bed. 
Among other things, it would be a fire hazard, you see, although that's not his point here, but uh, uh, you don't do that. It's, it's contrary to the whole purpose of lighting the lamp. What do you do? You put it on a lampstand. It's some kind of elevated device that's intended to make the light visible. And then a subtlety in Luke's version, so that those who are going in may see the light. Uh, Matthew tells the same story, but he re- changes the preposition there. Those who are in may see the light. And so commentators generally view that as Matthew's concern more for Jewish people who, in a sense, are already in but aren't seeing the light. And so the light is lit in the household of faith so that they, you see, the covenant community, will see it and be saved by it. Whereas Luke has more concern for the Gentiles. So they're the ones who are the outsiders. And he changes it subtly. So those who are going in, as if drawn from the outside to the light and entering the door. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that the Gentiles were far off, but have been brought near, you see, through the blood of the cross, made fellow members of the commonwealth of Israel. And so it seems that Luke maybe subtly has that in mind. But uh, more to the point here, is the whole deal that uh, this has to do with the gospel, the message of Christ being light. It stands in a kind of contrast to the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower told us that the seed goes out, goes to all kinds of ground. Some is rocky, some is forbidding, some is the path, some are thorny, and so on. Most of it produces nothing, but some of it produces fruit. Now, we might think, okay, therefore, if I am a sower, I should be real careful about what ground of ground I'm dealing with, you see. I should be asking people, are you appropriate ground for my labors as an evangelist? Are you good ground? Like a litmus test, you know, testing everybody that comes to see whether they are a proper recipient of my labors as a messenger of the gospel. Uh, Are you elect, you know? Do we have any evidence? Or am I going to waste my time with you? That kind of thing. And and somebody might actually uh, think in those terms. And so this parable of the light is to just stand on the opposite side of that, to correct that misunderstanding. There's plenty of seed. There's plenty of light. Uh, Jesus' command is that we go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not just elect creatures, you know, not just worthy creatures, not just creatures that meet some prior conditions, and that's really the message here. No one lights a lamp. Jesus is the light of the world. He's not, he's not in a sense, teaching in parables or involved in his ministry to obscure or to make, maybe I'll put it this way, to make... Uh, somehow I'll put on a limited availability this message. It goes to the world. And so probably first and foremost, that's what this uh, is trying to teach us, that there's a kind of, of uh, impulse in the gospel that it goes to the world. No one lights this and just puts it in a hidden place. Uh, so that's kind of the fundamental thing, and that's a corrective then to the parable of the sower. At least it balances what might have been a misunderstanding. Then a little bit more profoundly, verse 17, there is nothing secret that's not going to be made manifest. There's nothing hidden that won't be broadcast, made known and broadcast. This goes to the tendency of the gospel, and the tendency of the gospel is to make things known. Um, It is to bring secrets out into the open. That, in a sense, makes the Christian movement unlike many movements in the ancient world and through history. Uh, In the ancient world, both in the Jewish world and in the Hellenistic world that surrounded it, there were a lot of what were called mystery religions. You know, a mystery religion. We don't know much about them because they were mysterious by design. They had all kinds of secret rites. The inner sanctum was not to be intruded upon by the uninitiated. And so they'd always have layers of kind of like degrees of progress. And you might start off as just an outsider, a learner. 
And then eventually, as you continue, you might move to the second level, and the third level, and eventually you'll learn the secret handshake, and then the secret formula, the code, and then finally, maybe after years, you know, you reach the very, the top rung. And you know, religions like that have a great deal of appeal. Because you can always say to people, well, you just haven't quite gotten it all yet. You see, there's the, the, the real secrets are right around the corner here, and you need to keep coming and keep learning and so on. And it's very, very popular in religious uh, circles to have that. And in fact, uh, it's, it's almost a mark of a cult that you will have this kind of uh, uh, design in which you always have to pay a little more, do a little more, press a little harder, try a little, and so on, and then you'll get it. It's always that kind of futures, you know. L. Ron Hubbard famously invented the religion called Scientology. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I tell you, if you've got enough money, there's no limit to the things you can learn, the degrees you can obtain. I think I mentioned to you once before, L. Ron Hunter, Hubbard said once, the quickest way he knew to make a million dollars was to start a religion. And he proved it. <laughs> See, he was kind of a B-rated sci-fi writer till he invented Scientology. And then, I, I'm, and but it's an expensive proposition to go through all of those levels, you know, and all of that. And, and but that's not just true of that. There, there's uh, multiple religions that have that feature. Christianity is not that way. It, Jesus was a public figure. He did what he did in the open public square. Anybody could be there and observe. There was no private cabal. There was no secret society, you know, some inner, internal formula that you only learn when you're a truly advanced kind of person. It's wide open to anybody. This church, Presbyterian church, like most churches, has no inner sanctum. There's no secret chamber that you can only enter if you've met certain prior conditions. Now, if you're going to walk into the pastor's study, it's nice if you make an appointment, you know what I'm saying? But, but it's not as if that's somehow hallowed ground and ordinary mortals dare not tread there. You see, nothing of that. There's nothing of that. And virtually every cult has created that. But the Christian faith stands for a tendency to be wide open and transparent. And it has that effect on individual people. A mark of Christian maturity is there's no pretense. There's no layers. It's not like you're talking to someone right out of a soap opera. All kinds of hidden agendas, you know, strange kind of inner motives that nobody knows about. No, the Christian is just right there. <coughs> what you see is what you get. That was what's so troubling and disarming about Jesus. He just... He just was what he was with such integrity that it put us in our duplicity and our hypocrisy to shame. You know, that was part of what was so troubling about his presence. It's also true in the public square where the gospel is proclaimed. It tends to rip away the masks of pretense and so on. Uh, it's been true, uh, really, in some ways, I think this verse, at least I saw some that construed it to say it, in some ways was the, the impulse behind in some ways, the, the whole birth of the modern scientific age, this conviction that God is a God who's created a universe that's fundamentally reasonable, and he invites us to learn it, you know. And so many of the early people we associate with the birth of modern science were basically committed to a, a Christian outlook. You know, Michael Faraday, Isaac Newton was a little weird in some of his beliefs, but even he had a fundamentally, you know, theological uh, uh, conviction about the universe and so on. And, you know, that, that, that's the idea. I've, I've always appreciated, most of you in this room are old enough to uh, be quite familiar with the name Billy Graham. When I say that to my kids at school, isn't that troubling? You know, you say to a 15-year-old Billy Graham and they go, who? You think, what, what? How old am I? I mean, really, goodness sakes, you know, but... But, uh, you know, one of, I think one of the wonderful things about his ministry through the years is, and you probably you know this, Billy Graham always had an open financial books policy. Anybody could walk into the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association headquarters, it didn't matter who you were, and you could see all of the finances of that organization. You could see what he himself was paid, what all his people were paid. It was open books, you know. That's Christian. Not that we should be checking each other's checkbooks or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But the point is there's an impulse in the gospel toward a kind of transparency. The things that are hidden will be 
revealed. And in a sense, the Christian gospel causes us to uh, lean in that direction. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, uh, again, it's the light is out there and the light illumines and it brings to light even the things in darkness. So then the warning in verse 18, beware therefore, or literally, see therefore how you hear. That's a little play on words in Luke's version, but it's usually translated um, uh, simply the idea of beware, but literally see how you hear. Think about or be cautious about how you hear. Um, the gospel, the message of Christ, is something like the sacrament. It's a two-edged sword. Um, you know that the sacraments, there's warnings. The, the, the sacramental cup is called a cup of blessing that we bless, but Paul also just deal, talks about it as if it were a cup of cursing. Uh, you know, he said, let a man examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Uh, some drink it unworthily to their own destruction. You know, We should judge ourselves lest we be judged. In other words, we come to the sacrament and we come with a real healthy sense that this can be a very good thing for me as I come with a clear conscience and an open heart toward Christ who calls me to the table, but it can be a, a negative thing if I come filled with deceitfulness, filled with a kind of resistance or rebellion, then I'd, be, I'd best be stay away. I should, I should repent first, then come, you know, because the same cup that might be blessing for one could be poison for another. The gospel's kind of the same way. Uh, we walk into a church service, we hear a wonderful sermon, the sermon explores our hearts. You know, uh, Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. You know, that's addressed to Christians. That's not an evangelistic verse at all. It's addressed to Christians. And in some ways, it's not just the front door of your house, but at least in, in a sense in the metaphor, it's every door in your house. So he's knocking on that closet door. What's in there? Oh, you don't want to know what's in there. Nothing in there much. You know, it's just, you know, how many doors do we kind of keep locked uh, as the sermon explores us? Uh, that's what a sermon does. A good sermon knocks on the door. The message of the gospel asks for admission. And the warning here is we ought to be very careful how we hear because if the gospel comes to me, if the word of Christ comes to me and it starts knocking on a door, and I say, no way, you're not getting in there. You know, that's private. Jesus, you can have everything else. The living room is very nice. I've, I've made it, the, the, you know, the family Bible's right there on the coffee table. That's where I want you to, but please, please, not that closet back there. Well, you know what happens. As soon as we shut one door, the others begin to shut, you know. Uh, be careful how you hear, because the person who thinks they have something will ultimately lose it. Jesus, you know, doesn't want half the enchilada here. He wants it all. He doesn't take it all at once, but he wants access to all of it, and he'll kind of take it by inches as we grow in grace and in, in faith, but to never slam the door. It's a very painful thing. Um, my wife knows I'm a highly secretive person. I, I am. I just keep secrets by nature. It makes me very deceitful. I, God's had to hammer me hard on this. You don't believe that, do you? But it's true. It's true. And I've shed tears over my own secretiveness. But God just keeps kicking the door, and by his grace, they open eventually. And the hinges are rusty, and they hardly the door hardly opens. But it's good for us. It's good. And that's what the gospel does. So be careful how you hear. Great sermons, pathetic Sunday school lessons, whatever it is, <laughs> listen to it carefully, thoughtfully, knowing that this may be when God is saying, I'd like to take a look in that closet. You know, I'd like to take a look in that bedroom. I'd like to take a look in that little secret cupboard. That's what the gospel does. It has a tendency to reveal. The mission of Christ is to make hidden things open. Sometimes the big lie sells for a while. Stalin made famous that idea. You tell a big enough lie, loud enough, you'll get people to believe it. And for a while that's true, but ultimately it isn't true. 
It was not true of Stalin. It's not true of any of us individually. Ultimately, the gospel brings hidden things to light. It's better for us to do that, in a sense, voluntarily, you know, rather than uh, with the more severe um, sense that that can sometimes take. So anyway, there's the first one. The next one uh, is the story of, the, uh, of Jesus and his mother and his brothers. And like I say, once we go through this, I want you to think to yourself, what better word can I use here? Because I don't quite like that one, but I'm at a loss for something better. What I mean by unite is he unites us in a new and truer family than mere biological Connections. That seems to be Luke's point, at least to some degree. Let's look at it, verse 19. His mother and his brothers came to him, but were not able to draw near to him because of the crowd. It was said to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, wishing to see you. He answered and said to them, mother to me and brothers to me, are these who hear and do the word of God. So a short little story. Every gospel writer includes it, except John. Uh, But all three synoptics include some version of this. Very strange moment when Jesus is approached by his uh, his mother and his brothers. A little technical point just uh, on the side here. Most of you are familiar with this, so I won't uh, delay on it too long. But just to say, there's always this question, who were the brothers of Jesus, you know? Um, the Roman Catholic Church has, in principle, objected to the idea that Mary had other children. They've been very concerned to protect her perpetual virginity. Uh, and of obviously, even in that married relationship with Joseph, to protect that, it would mean that there were no intimate uh, relationships between uh, Mary and Joseph, that she remained to the time of her Uh, The assumption at the end of her life, you know, the Roman Catholics don't teach that she died, but that she was, in a sense, uh, assumed into heaven, kind of like an ascension sort of thing. They also teach the Immaculate Conception, which is a reference to the birth of Mary, not to the birth of Jesus, and says that she was born without original sin. And so they're very concerned to protect absolutely the purity of Jesus. I'm sorry, the purity of Mary. And in Roman Catholic understanding, sex, even in marriage, has a little bit of a taint. It's not evil, but it has what they call concupiscence, which is that, here's the Roman Catholic definition, it's that which is of sin, inclines towards sin, but is not sin. Concupiscence, you know. They would say in baptism... Original sin is washed away, but concupiscence remains. That's Roman Catholic teaching. And they, won't, they don't want Mary to have any concupiscence, even, even the taint. And therefore, she has to be free from any kind of sexual activity of any sort, you see. Uh, well, then that creates a little problem, because it does say here, the brothers. Uh, and so how does Rome deal with that? The, uh, there's two theories that Rome has advanced. One is that the brothers of Jesus were sons of Joseph from a prior marriage. They view him probably as an older man, and he married Mary not so much out of romantic love, but out of kind of a patronly protection of her. Uh, And that was not uncommon in the ancient world. That certainly is hypothetically possible. And so the brothers of Jesus would actually be stepbrothers, as it were, you see, from from a prior marriage of Joseph's. That's one theory. The other is that they were cousins. Now, we in the Protestant tradition have generally, not exclusively, but generally uh, believed that uh, Mary probably had a normal marital relationship with Joseph, and these characters called brothers were actual sons and daughters too, actually, because there's some sisters in there of of Mary. Uh, Not all Protestants have agreed in that. Some Protestants have agreed with Rome on this point, and I don't want to go into technical details, but anyway, my own view is I think these were probably sons of Mary. Uh, that's, I don't have any authority on that, except that that's been mainstream Protestantism, and it seems the facial sense of it. So just for whatever it's worth, that little uh, point, it's not really the main point here, but uh, worth mentioning. Here they come, the mother and the brothers of Jesus, and they are, they're unable to get near him because of the crowd. Why does Luke tell us this? Why this story? Why did all three synoptic 
accounts include this. Uh, Mark, even more harshly, almost making Jesus dismissive of his, of his family, you know. Luke is more, more benign, but even he has that little element in it. Well, we usually think, you know, somebody's rich and famous, it's hard to get near them. If you're the President of the United States, you don't just you know, casually drop by and see the President. I mean, there's, there are layers of bureaucracy that more or less insulate people who are important from casual droppers by, but we always figure that family gets special treatment, right? You know, if, if my brother were President of the United States, I would think, well, he's my brother. I could drop by and see him because we have the family connection there. I might need to let him know I was going to drop by or something, but we, we assume that, and we would probably assume that about Jesus. Uh, Jesus has family, and we would think that they would get some kind of special uh, acknowledgement, special treatment, because that's the way things are. Again, many of you in this room are old enough to remember the wonderful photograph of JFK. You know, some of you were thinking about it already, right? He's sitting there, what, it's 1962 or something like that, and the photo of him in the prime, this is Camelot, you know, and in uh, Washington, D.C. there, and, and you've got John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office behind the presidential desk, and what else do you see in the same photo? John Jr. playing around under the desk, you see. He doesn't know this is the President of the United States. He just knows that's Daddy up there in that, in that big chair. And that's his safe place. And we just take, we, we smile at that because we, that's the way life is. That kid had special access to the President of the United States because he just happened to be his little boy. And, and you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. We would probably have thought that would be the case with respect to Jesus and his family. And the New Testament, in a sense, stands over against that with certain warnings about it. Uh, some of these are quite weighty. Uh, in the New Testament, for example, you know that the whole idea of being the seed of Abraham, the whole idea is changed rather profoundly. In the first century, there were people, contemporaries of Jesus, who could trace their family tree back to Adam. Can you imagine that? They knew what tribe of Israel they were in, and they could follow every link in the tree back to Abraham, and from Abraham back to Adam. I don't know if any of you have ever done genealogical work. I did a few years ago. I thought I'd try it. Found such dastardly people back there, I decided to give... Not really, not really. But... Uh, but uh, I got back about four generations, and then it just kind of goes into oblivion. I couldn't get any further, and I wondered, what's the point anyway? That was kind of my thought in doing it. But, um, uh, you know, some people, it's very important what genealogy you are, what, you know, descent you have, and so on. To the Jewish people in the first century, it was extremely important, and that's why it dropped like a nuclear bomb when Paul said repeatedly things like he says in Romans 2.28, he is not a Jew who is simply born a Jew. I mean, do you realize the kind of you know, explosive, controversial effect that would have on people who were so proud of their lineage to say, you know, you're not, you're, the fact that you're born a Jew, you don't even qualify to be a Jew. The fact that you're circumcised bodily means nothing ultimately as to whether you are the seed of Abraham. Paul says, those who are of faith are the seed of Abraham and heirs of the promises to Abraham and his seed. In other words, the family was defined not by birth, but by rebirth. It was defined by this very different understanding of your connection to Christ than simply what your family, you know, uh, attachments might be. In a sense, you see a little bit of that hinted at here. Uh, this has been a controversy. Again, I don't mean to be pecking on... Uh, Catholic Church here. I've got to speed up a little bit. But um, uh, I think, you know, in the history of the church, Rome has taught something called apostolic succession, that the true uh, apostolic authority is vested in the pope because the pope has received the keys of the kingdom and went all the way ba uh, back in unbroken uh, succession to Peter. You know, Peter received it, gave it to Lucian, gave it to Clement, kabing, 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 down through history, and now it's Pope um, um, Benedict, thank you, Ratzinger. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and then that's the, the, the belief is that that's what creates apostolic succession in the church. We in the Protestant tradition have said we believe in apostolic succession, but not in a bureaucratic sense. We believe to be in the apostolic succession means that you are in the spirit of the teaching of the apostles. That's where it is. In other words, it's the word of God and faithfulness to it that makes a church apostolic, not simply having this kind of bureaucratic uh, succession. And, and so something like that applies to Mary as well. Uh, I have a Roman Catholic friend, and we've talked all around these issues, and one of the issues that's come up occasionally is praying to Mary. You know, I think, I'm going to have a hard time with that, I'll say to my friend, you know, praying to Mary. And, uh, and he'll say, well, now, you know, we're not worshiping her. I mean, this is not worshiping Mary. And I've, I've heard it put just this way. But who would have better access to Jesus than his mother? So you pray to Mary, understanding that if she'll kind of take up your cause, then you may have a better chance of selling it, you know, to, to Jesus. I'm, I'm overstating that, but that's the principle there. You know, some, in some ways, praying to the saints has the same sort of thing. Well, what's interesting is, what does Luke say? He says, verse 20, it was said to her, your mother and your brothers are standing where? Outside. Outside. How come Mary and the brothers, I'm not being, I'm not, please don't, I'm not trying to be disparaging of Mary. I think Luke is making a point, though. Why is it that Mary and the brothers were outside? Why weren't they in the inner circle? Why weren't they some of these that were right there at the feet of Jesus, you know, lapping the huckam? They were the ones who were coming from somewhere else and trying to, what is this? You know, they're outside. It's a very interesting choice of words there that Luke uses. And then, of course, Jesus' response to it really drives the point home. He answered and said, and this is in Greek, it's, it's, it would translate something like this, mother to me, and brothers to me are these who, what, hear and do the word of God. The New Testament creates family, but it's not the family of birth. It's not the family simply of biological connections, family tree. Some of you in this room know that you have brothers and sisters in Christ with whom you have much deeper and richer fellowship than you've ever had with a biological sibling, you know. There is family and there is family. Now, that's not to say the New Testament disparages family. It certainly doesn't disparage Mary in that sense. Jesus from the cross is still discharging his duties as the head of the family. Joseph is presumably dead, and Jesus executes his last will and testament right from the cross. Mary, behold your son. John, behold your mother. He's, he's still doing the business of family. It's not to be despised or dismissed, but the point is in the New Testament, there's a deeper and more profound family that's created by virtue of our connections to Christ, and it transcends this you know, sort of biological uh, connection. So now, if you can come up with a word to help me, I'll appreciate it. I've used the word unite. I'd like to say something like, to family eyes. But I don't think that's a... Reco that's kind of a fancy word, but uh, maybe we'll... Uh, these multisyllabic words, um, you know. But I, I'll go with that. Reconstitute. It certainly is that. The trouble is that, Jerry, I'm not sure I can spell it. Reconstitute. Like I tell the kids at school, when in doubt, scribble. <laughs> so... Uh, My principal doesn't like that very much. <laughs> but he likes it better than my other axiom, when in doubt, cheat. Ah, he really doesn't like that. So, you know. so um, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll try that on for size here. All right, let's, let's go to the last uh, little story. This I'm calling this the, uh, the, the mission of Christ. He reveals, he unites us or reconstitutes family. That's good. And then he protects us, this story of the storm. Um, verse 22. It came about on one of those days that Jesus um, went down into a boat and his disciples with him. And he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. And as they were going along, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind upon the lake 
swamping them so that they were imperiled. And they came and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. He rose up and rebuked the wind and the tantrum of the water. <coughs> and it ceased. And there was a great calm. Then he said to them, where's your faith? They were traumatized by fear and began saying to one another, what kind of man is this who commands the wind and the water, I'm sorry, who rebukes the wind and the water and it obeys him? So there's, that one always brings back the flannel graph images too, you know, I probably remember those. All right. Uh, they went down to the, uh, on one of those days and got into a boat and he said to us, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. You know, this is it's wonderful because now Jesus is letting the disciples do the thing that they are thoroughly competent to do. Isn't that nice? You know, they're watching Jesus heal people, preach sermons, do these amazing things. They are utterly outclassed by Jesus. None of them can do these things. They are looking at someone who is transcendently superior to them and all of those. But finally, Jesus has asked them to do something they can do. You know, the fishers, they've done this for a career. If there's anything they know how to do, it's to sail a boat from one side of the lake to the other. No big deal, you know. So uh, I always, you know, kind of, it's a little bit humorous because you realize how often uh, we feel that way. God calls us to great things, and we all, we're humbled, we're on our knees, we're praying for mercy and help and so on. But if God calls you to do a little thing, stuff some envelopes, you know, just some minor thing, then we, oh, I can handle this. Jesus, take a nap. Just chill out. I've got this one covered. You know, and so there's a little bit of humor, I think, in the story that Luke, uh, I think, intends for us to pick up. So anyway, uh, you know, they launch out. They launched out. No problem. As they were going along, he fell asleep. Jesus slept. This uh, has often been pointed out. Liberal Christians, or liberal theology, maybe I'll say, is a better way to put it, tends to emphasize the humanity of Christ but obscure his deity. Conservative Christianity, conservative theology, and I candidly acknowledge that's more my own uh, tilt, uh, tends to obscure the humanity of Christ but em emphasizes deity. That's tended to be the case, you know. Uh, sometimes to an extreme on both accounts. The proper place to be is where you have a, an equivalent emphasis on both. One of the hardest things, I think, for us from a Protestant and, and evangelical perspective is to really take seriously that Jesus was a human being. And he was limited by all the things that limit us. Uh, you know, he was a man. He was flesh and blood. He got tired. He got hungry. He had to, uh, you know, do things that involved physical labor and felt the weariness of it. And that was just part of what he was dealing with. He didn't always have his deity, as it were, in his back pocket and just pull it out every time he needed it, you know. Even when he performed miracles, he's performing miracles in the same way that an Elijah or a Moses or other miracle workers in the Bible perform miracles. It's not Jesus invoking his deity, it's Jesus falling back on the power that God provides to him just as he provides to any of his people that trust him to do what God has called them to do. And so for 33 years on this planet, Jesus was truly man and truly God, but he never, ever, ever invoked his, his supernatural power as God to get him out of a jam, you know. He was always living as a man. So he slept, and, and that in itself, I think, is you know, one of many instances we see something like that. More uh, to the probably theological point here, there are times when Jesus does very much seem to be sleeping, you know. And, and when we feel up to the task, we don't mind. Jesus, take a nap. It's fine, you know. But now, of course, it's in this unexpected moment when they feel competent that we have this intrusion. Um, there came down on the, uh, a, 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 literally it reads, a storm of wind. And what comes to mind here would be something like a little whirlwind or cyclone or something 
the sky is probably clear. It's probably a lovely day, you know, and there's not a, a cloud in the sky and so on. All of a sudden, you're just caught in the vortex of this, this uh, kind of squall that just kind of blows in and catches you unaware. And that does happen, as I understand it, on the Sea of Galilee occasionally. So all of a sudden, they're just, you know, put right to the edge. Um, uh, they dealt with this before, but this seems to be over the top. The boat is being swamped, and they are in peril. They come, and they say to Jesus, Master, Master, we're perishing. Uh, Sigmund Freud has the problem as an atheist of trying to explain why, if there is no God, why is there so much religion? And, of course, Freud the inventor of psychology, explains it from a psychological point of view. And he says, well, the reason, he gives several scenarios, re, uh, hypothetical, uh, hypothetical explanations. The reason that there is religion, even though there is no God, he says one explanation is it's an unresolved Oedipal complex. Doesn't that sound very Freudian? You know, I won't bother you with that one. But the one that does kind of come to mind in this case, he also says, well, possibly the source of religion is it's a phobia. Religion is a phobic reaction. And the way he paints it is like this. Primitive man living in his little, you know, jungle situation, you know, this sort of idealized uh, uh, situation we think of, is surrounded by the impersonal and threatening forces of nature. And it's very threatening to him because what do you do with an impersonal force? You know. If you're running at me with a spear, threatening my well-being, I have some things I can do because you are a person. I can plead for mercy. I can bargain. I can beg. I can threaten. I can flatter. You know, all kinds of things I can do to try to appeal to you as a person not to injure me with your spear. But how do you negotiate with a hurricane? You know, how do you reason with a tornado? The imperson, in other words, Freud says the impersonal forces of nature are more threatening to us than personal threats. Impersonal, more scary than personal threats. So what do we do? He says we create the god of the storm. So now we've got a person we can pray to, and then over time that evolves into religion and Christianity and so on. You know how Freud would uh, do that. Well, I wish uh, I could have talked to Freud and at least pointed out to him this verse. I want you to, to um, notice what happens here. Because I think he's incomplete. I think his analysis is actually a, a plausible explanation for some religions in this world. Calvin says we are factories of idolatry. I, I do believe we do some of the things Freud said. But Freud left out at least some possible explanations here. That, so notice what it says. Um, they came to him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. He rose up. Now, the word that's used here for rebuke is a word that would imply rebuking a child like a toddler. Now, you stop that. It's that kind of thing. There's no, there's no great drama. Peace, be still. You know, like Jesus up there, I'm not doing this real big deal. No, it's just rebuking a child. Now, you be still. And the word that's translated the raging of the water can be rendered something like a tantrum. Like, it's like nature throwing a little temper tantrum. There's no contest. In other words, there's nothing here in which Jesus is sort of in a battle of wills with nature and he's doing some great voodoo to make... No. His absolute authority is not questioned in the least. He just says, no, settle down. And nature just obeys instantly. What would you expect the disciples to do in response to that? And the disciples rejoiced in the great display of God's power, which had protected them from the ravages of the storm. You know, that's what you would think this would be a great, a great sigh of relief. But what it actually says here, and Luke uses very strong words, you know, verse 25, where's your faith? They were traumatized by fear. And the Greek word there is the word phobia. <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's what I'd like to point out to Freud. It's the word phobethentes. They were, they were traumatized, seized with a great fear. I mean, in other words, the, the implication is they would have rather dealt with the storm. They felt safer 
in the, in the ravages of the storm than to see this one with this kind of alien authority, this unspeakable power. What kind of man is this? They're just shrinking back. You can see this. He commands the storm and obeys him. Freud left that out. He doesn't explain why Christians have invented a, the, a, a God who is more threatening to them by far than any of the normal threats of nature. We are God-fearing people because we view God as, among other things, a consuming fire. We view him as one who is ultimately threatening to us. As, as Jesus says, don't fear the one who can just kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul. You know? In other words, we've created a very unlikely deity to give ourselves a sense of peace in a hostile universe. This doesn't quite fit, in other words, with Freud's uh, analysis. In this story, Mark is even more dramatic to it, but I think you get, get the point here. Uh, well, this one who is so frightening to us, nevertheless, is one who, with that great authority, is determined to care for us. And his mission is one of dividing out his people, revealing to them truth, uniting us in a family, and protecting us from any harm that may come, you see, that we are... We are those who are guarded by his supernatural power and, and thus as we do the things he calls us to do, we can do it without fear. One final note and I'll stop. Jesus raises the question, where was your faith? Where was your faith? Uh, one commentator made the little quip. He said the disciples um, thought that Jesus was sleeping. Actually, it was their faith that was sleeping. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Where was oh, our faith was sound asleep? You know, we didn't think we needed faith here. We didn't think we needed trust. We thought we had this under control, and uh, so that's where the faith was hiding under the covers. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's close in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you create a family in which we can join together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can call. You, our Father, we can call Christ our brother. We can have this wonderful familial connection. We thank you that you have united us together in this way, that you promise to protect us. We thank you for your unquestioned authority over everything in life and that we can trust you. But we pray you'd always guard us from being at ease in Zion, that we would always have a deep sense that we are dealing with Almighty God and that we'll have before you that reverence that is proper for the people of God. We give you thanks for it and for our time together this morning. In the name of Christ, amen.